The close of 1135 had witnessed both the death and coronation of a king. Stephen, maternal grandson of William the Conqueror, sat uncomfortably upon the throne of England, having put down several minor risings up to 1138. In that very year, a northern army had also beaten back the larger host of David, King of Scots, at the Battle of the Standard. Yet, despite several risings, Stephen's crown appeared relatively secure in these initial rocky years of his reign. 1138, however, would with hindsight be a critical year that transformed the uneasy and hard-won peace in the kingdom into a full-blown war for the very destiny of England. We all know history repeats itself, even niche 10th century English history. Violent transitions of power, never-ending wars, a huge wealth gap between the ruling class and everyday citizens. These are problems we still face today, and honestly, the disparity might be even worse nowadays. A stunning survey recently revealed that over half of Americans making six figures now live paycheck to paycheck. Even Goldman Sachs is honest about where the market is probably headed, nowhere. No wonder CEOs and fund managers are pouring hundreds of millions into low correlation assets. Because even if markets flatline this year, these assets can continue to climb. Now, according to a recent report by Citibank, of these assets, the one with the lowest correlation is contemporary art. And contemporary art prices have more than doubled the S&P 500's return over the last 26 years. Now Masterworks lets you invest in multi-million dollar paintings without breaking the bank. And they've built a track record of 11 exits, all of them profitable. No wonder Masterworks has seen over 650,000 members try to gain access, and there is a waitlist. But I reached out to them to give you all VIP access to their latest offerings. Just check the description below. The pretender to Stephen's crown, the Empress Matilda, had held little real hope of enforcing her claim to her father's throne in these initial years, holding court in southern Normandy. Her husband Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, balked at supplying men and funds to back what seemed to be a forlorn endeavor. Matilda, despite oaths to uphold her succession in 1127, had no major support in England itself. No major noble had declared for her, though in this key year, her prospects would be dramatically transformed by the actions of one man. Matilda was not the only prominent child of King Henry I. Henry had had many bastard children, the greatest of which was Robert, whom he made Earl of Gloucester in the early 1120s. Robert was possibly a native or constable of Caen, holding lands in Normandy, as well as the honor of Gloucester. Like Stephen before late 1135, Robert had been a favorite of King Henry, though the two men may have been equally envious of each other during the period. Robert had reluctantly accepted Stephen's accession after the fact, being confirmed in his lands and titles by the latter. He had accompanied his lord to the siege of Exeter, and was even present with his king in Normandy in 1137 to fight Matilda's husband, Geoffrey. According to William of Malmesbury, Robert had always intended to support his half-sister's claim to the crown, though this is arguable. According to this toxic mix of resentment that already existed between the two men, Robert also begrudged the royal favor shown to other major figures, like the Beaumont brothers and William of Ypres, Stephen's loyal Flemish mercenary captain. The catalyst for Robert's overt defection to Matilda came in this year. William of Malmesbury writes that Stephen, fearing this great lord was already in contact with and on the verge of defecting to the Angevin cause, ordered Robert's hated rival William of Ypres to ambush and capture him. If true, the attempt was a catastrophic failure. What's more, Stephen was forced to agree a three-year truce with Geoffrey following the effective disintegration of his own army near Lisieux in the same year. Having settled matters in Normandy, Stephen took ship to England, never returning to the duchy. 
Robert ominously remained, perhaps consulting with other Angevin sympathizers, including King Stephen's old pal Baldwin de Redvias, before in May of 1138, he finally issued his diffidatio. The public rejection of Stephen resulted in the latter's confiscation of Robert's English lands, though actually enforcing this was a different matter. By the autumn of 1138, the Empress Matilda had joined Robert in northern Normandy, the two preparing their forces throughout the winter and into the spring of 1139. By the summer of that year, all was set for the Matildine phase of the war to commence. However, their plans may have been complicated by the capture of Dover by Stephen's Queen Matilda, forcing the Angevin party to be creative in their route to England. Matilda and Robert would arrive at Arundel on the 30th of September, though ahead of them went the irascible Baldwin de Redvius. Baldwin had already rebelled and been defeated by Stephen twice in 1136, losing Exeter and the Isle of Wight, and therefore naturally sided with the Angevins thereafter. He landed at Wareham in early August, which had been Earl Roberts but had been taken by the king. Here he was barred entry, though he was admitted to Corf Castle nearby. King Stephen marched to besiege him there, yet no sooner had he done so did Matilda and Robert slip into Arundel, ostensibly at the invitation of the Queen Dowager and the pair's stepmother, Adeliza. The two were accompanied by just 140 knights that added to the seemingly benign nature of the landing. Earl Robert wasted no time in riding hard for his own lands, with an escort of about a dozen knights, whereas Matilda remained, as it turned out, to face the army of her royal cousin. Robert did manage to reach Bristol and the heartland of his support, though on the way he may have been halted by the men of Henry of Blois, who interestingly allowed his passage and may have agreed some kind of deal with the rebellious Earl. In the event, Henry would play an important role in events at Arundel and beyond. To modernize, Stephen's blockade of his rival in Arundel appeared to end the conflict before it had truly begun. However, it's likely Stephen saw Robert as the true threat to his position. His cousin had the formal excuse of invitation from another senior royal, and no army to speak of within Arundel itself. The details are lost to time, but the aforementioned Henry of Blois, Bishop of Winchester, and the king's younger brother, brokered an agreement whereby Matilda was permitted safe conduct into Robert's sphere of control. It is possible that the deal stipulated Matilda's agreement not to take up arms against him. If so, this was a pledge later broken. It is also true to say that if Arundel had been besieged and resisted, Stephen's time, treasure and resources would have been focused there, rather than on the greater threat of a free and recruiting Robert of Gloucester. Whatever the truth, Matilda was ultimately escorted to Bristol, the seat of Angevin control. Thus, by the fall of 1139, the boundaries had been mostly set. Matilda located herself at Gloucester, apart from her brother's base at Bristol. The end of 1139 into the year of 1140 was a bloody settling into these zones of control. Stephen's strategy in this period was to take the smaller castles around Bristol as a prelude to capturing Robert's stronghold itself. He left Wallingford, at the fringes of Angevin control, under siege, heading west, but was soon forced to retreat as miles of Gloucester cut across the king's rear to defeat his forces at Wallingford. The Angevins attacked and sacked Worcester in November of 1139 and then Nottingham in September of 1140. Both actions likely meant to show Stephen's weakness as a ruler in failing to protect his subjects. Stephen too had marched into Cornwall following the defection of his lieutenant there, but ultimately failed to secure the region for the crown. This initial phase of the Matildine conflict was thus characterized by stalemate. The Angevin faction could not hope to actually oust Stephen as king without some major rising in the east or through a decisive and crushing victory in battle, 
and Stephen could not seemingly retake the West and stamp his authority over the entirety of his kingdom. Yet such a decisive engagement was not far off. The events leading to King Stephen's own downfall in the next year were already developing in the north. Ranulf, Earl of Chester, happened to be married to the daughter of none other than Robert, Earl of Gloucester himself, but was also the half-brother of a certain William de Rumere, who, holding lands in both Normandy and Lincolnshire, had been deeply offended by King Stephen's creation of the Earldom of Lincoln in 1139. But the awarding of the honor to William de Albany, the husband of the Queen Dowager and custodian of Arundel Castle. Sometime in 1140, King Stephen reshuffled his earls, granting the earldom of Lincoln to de Romare and moving de Albany south as Earl of Arundel. To complicate matters, Stephen also conferred the office of constable of the castle to Ranulf, but not full control. The exact sequence of events during this time is not clear. Orderic Vitalis' dramatic account of the half-brothers seizing the whole castle by a ruse may in actuality mask a more complicated situation. Ranulf was granted the constableship of the castle, but only occupied Luce's tower, a part of the castle, while Stephen's men held the rest. This in itself may have irritated the irascible Earl of Chester. A further factor was the presence of the bishop, Alexander, who himself had fortified his own cathedral and was enhancing his own power base within the city. Though unclear whether at this stage Stephen's men occupied the entirety of the castle or excluding Lucy's tower, now Audric's account of the catalyst of hostilities makes more sense. The two men entered Lincoln Castle on the pretext of retrieving their visiting wives, Ranulf gaining entry with just a few men, before overwhelming the guards and throwing open the gates to de Romare's party, who had been in hiding nearby. The castle was thus now in the hands of the disgruntled siblings, but the city itself was mostly hostile. The men of Lincoln thus sent word south for aid from King Stephen. Stephen, with his usual rapidity, assembled a force and marched to confront this latest affront to his authority. Reaching the city by the end of Christmas 1140, Stephen set about pounding the garrison with his siege engines, his men having initially captured 17 knights who had been relaxing in the city as he entered it. Though blockading the rebels with the enthusiastic support of the city folk, Stephen was unable to prevent the flight of Ranulf himself, who left his half-brother and his own wife to ride hard for Cheshire where he could assemble reinforcements. Simultaneously, word was sent to Robert informing him that his daughter was now besieged in Lincoln Castle. Ranulf additionally naturally swore fealty to Matilda in return for aid, though in reality, he may have had little choice. In response, Earl Robert, along with Miles of Gloucester, mustered their own army in support, including many disinherited nobles who had also eagerly joined their ranks, as well as a large force of Welshmen. Gloucester's force then headed north. The Empress Matilda, in whose name both Robert and Ranulf fought, could only await tidings of events within her base at Gloucester. The Angevin host, jointly led by Robert, Miles, and Ranulf, appeared just south of Lincoln on February 1st of 1141, marching from the west across the Witham River. Evil portents supposedly plagued the king, the night before battle witnessing a foul storm of hail, rain, as well as the starker signs of divine disapproval in thunder and lightning. In a service on the very day of battle itself, the candle the king held for his part in proceedings broke apart in his hands, its flame snuffed out, and perhaps a dark harbinger of things to come. Yet if this was so, King Stephen remained resolute, and despite his advisers urging his withdrawal in the face of the larger Angevin force, the king elected to stand and fight. Having concluded their respective speeches and insults to their foes, each army arrayed themselves in similar formations of three groups, or battles. 
King Stephen had his knights dismounted and formed around himself on foot in the largest group, along with some militiamen of Lincoln in support. It's also likely many militiamen remained in the city itself to deal with any sortie from the castle. The left wing of Stephen's army was commanded by the Earl of York, along with William of Ypres, with his right comprising a small band of earls and their retinues. These two formations made up of small amounts of cavalry. Mirroring Stephen's central battle was Robert of Gloucester's. Robert too had dismounted many of his knights in his group. The exact formation and composition of the Angevin army in particular is tricky, the source is differing on exact placement. However, it appears Welshmen were present on both wings in the van position, marching slightly ahead. The Angevin cavalry wings were led by Ranulf and likely Miles of Gloucester, respectively. The first action of the battle saw these poorly armed Welshmen quickly driven from the field by the attacks of both royal wings. These brave Welshmen likely stood little chance against the charge of trained, better equipped and determined knights. However, though the Angevin infantry was driven from the field, the wings following on behind remained resolute in meeting the royalists. It was now the turn of Stephen's wings to take to flight. Though details are once more sketchy, it appears both wings had already conceded that defeat was probable. Indeed, Ranulf's engagement of Stephen's left wing may have been preceded by arrow volleys that, in addition to the general disorder created from the rout of the Welsh, made William of Ypres' wing easy meat for Ranulf's men. Similarly, the opposite wing was also driven to flight. King Stephen, however, remained rooted in position. Though the exact sequence of events on the wings is unclear, the conclusion of events is not. King Stephen now doggedly fought off the Angevins as they pressed in on all sides, one source writing that the assaults were like an attack all around a castle. Some lords had remained at their king's side, Stephen fighting ferociously with his sword, men said to recoil from his terrible arm. When the king's very sword broke in the melee, a man of Lincoln handed his king a battle axe with which he continued to fight on like a cornered wild boar. Indeed, Robert of Torigny wrote that the king kept his ground like a lion, standing single-handed in field. Alas, even this sturdy weapon broke with overuse. The king eventually felled ingloriously with a stone, stunning him long enough to be taken by one of Earl Robert's household men. Robert ordered that his royal cousin be left unharmed, though the latter complained loudly that this was no way to treat a king. As for the unfortunate men of Lincoln, they could expect no such leniency from the victors. Around 500 drowned attempting to swim the nearby river, more than had fallen to the Angevins in Malay. The town itself was also ravaged, with churches and houses set ablaze. For King Stephen, the day was an undoubted catastrophe. Robert had him taken before Matilda herself in Gloucester, before being transferred to the Angevin stronghold of Bristol. What words were spoken during this meeting are unfortunately lost to history, though it's likely the Empress emphasized her own superior claim, yet treated Stephen with all the respect and courtesy due to an anointed monarch. Though confined to Bristol, Stephen was initially permitted some liberty within the area, though according to William of Malmesbury, the king had been found wandering at times beyond his appointed limits and thus was eventually clapped in irons. There could be no question then that following the Battle of Lincoln, Matilda's path to her coronation now lay wide open. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1 or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.